welcome to you all. Um, we hope that many of you have been involved in our first two events. This is our finale. Um, you can find recordings of the previous events on YouTube for a limited time. We won't keep them up there forever, but at the moment they're on YouTube and the links will go into the chat. They'll also go into the PDF that we'll be sharing with you at the end of the session after we finish. First of all, some technical housekeeping. You are all muted, but very welcome to post any questions or make comments in the chat. Please engage respectfully with others. Be polite, positive and proportionate in how you communicate. We've also got a, a menti link and we'd like you to choose a word that captures what you like about mathematics or teaching it. And you can make as many as three choices during the course of the event and we'll share the results with you at the end. So we thought that would be a bit of fun. Hope you enjoy that. Um, be as creative as you like. If you'd like to continue the conversation, as I said just now, then please do use the Maths is More hashtag. Again, the link will be in the chat. The format of this seminar will be four short talks from our four speakers, followed by a very brief question and answer session related to those talks. If you have other questions that you don't feel are more are general, then please put them in the chat and we'll endeavour to answer them as we go through. Um, after those four talks, we'll go to all our panellists who have spoken at one of our events and ask them for their concluding thoughts. Once again, we'll be recording the event, but only the, the initial speakers' contributions and the final contributions from the plenary pa panel. So that explains the very long list of speakers that you'll be seeing across the top of your screen. They will appear later on rather than just be names, but that's where we are at the moment. So our first event focused on the nature of mathematics as a rich and creative subject. The second looked at how that view looks in some classrooms. This time we're focusing on where we can take these ideas from here. So what next? Once again, we've had some amazing speakers. And once again, we're looking all across the phases from three to 19. We split for our middle seminar, but we're all coming back together. We think there are messages across the age range which are really important. So let's make a start. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Camilla Gilmore as our first speaker. Camilla is, the professor, is a professor of mathematical cognition at Loughborough University and director of the ESRC Centre for Early Mathematics Learning, which will be launched this summer. Her research focuses on understanding how mathematic, mathematical skills develop with particular attention to early years development. So Camilla is going to set the scene for us today. Thank you, Camilla. Great, thank you, Jenny. And it's really um, great to be able to join in this conversation um, today. So let me just get my slides up. Great, so yes, I'm gonna be talking about um, research informed practice and thinking about how research can contribute to this idea of a very rich and broad perspective on mathematics education. So I think we can all agree that over the past decade, there's been a huge amount of investment into educational research and a real transformation in the way that um, we think about research and the discussions around research. But I think unfortunately so far, um, this hasn't led to the kind of large scale breakthrough in understanding or practice that many people might have hoped. And in fact, there's been lots of question raised about how should we be using research to inform practice? So for example, Sharples points out that we shouldn't be using research in a kind of recipe book way of thinking about practice. So it is clear that research evidence cannot simply dictate what should happen in the classroom. And I think that instead we need um, researchers and practitioners working together to negotiate our understanding of what the implications are of practice, of research for practice. And so in that way, um, teachers can make decisions based on their professional expertise and judgment, but in the light of the best scientific evidence. 
But it's always important to remember that research is complex, it's often contradictory, and the findings may be nuanced. And while it might be um, tempting to simplify this to be able to provide a really straightforward message, this does a disservice both to researchers and also to teachers. So if those are some of the concerns about research informed practice, where is the value of research? What can it contribute? Well, I think there's a number of different things. So I think research can start a conversation about different practices and resources and give um, teachers an opportunity to reflect on their own practice. It can support decision making by schools and teachers, along with other forms of evidence. I think it can give teachers the confidence to change their practice in the light of um, research evidence, but also not to change their practice if they believe that what they're doing is right and the research can support that. I think a really important role for research is to identify causal mechanisms of learning and to build theory about how learners learn. But this is not the same as just identifying what works in a very simplistic way. Rather, it's about identifying the mechanisms that underpin learning and then allowing teachers to make judgments about what they do in the classroom to build on those mechanisms. Of course, we can use research to evaluate a specific program in a specific context or set of contexts as seen in the kind of large scale evaluation trials. But again, it's not the same as showing what works in a general sense. This only allows us to compare a specific program with a specific alternative. I think another role of research is to identify hidden skills that might be influencing children's learning. So here we might use different kinds of research designs that can identify things like the role of spatial skills and spatial reasoning across the, the broad breadth of the mathematics curriculum. And also research that's shown that executive functions, these skills that help us to control our thoughts and action, how important that is for learning and particularly building our more advanced understanding of mathematics. Now, it's often been suggested that research introduces fads into education, but I think if it's used um, appropriately, it, um, research can actually reduce fads. So this might be by evaluating um, approaches and demonstrating that they're not effective, but also if we have good theory about how um, children learn, then we should be able to identify the fads that won't be effective before we even get to the point of evaluating them. And finally, I think research can help us to identify learners who might need particular extra support and can suggest what kind of support might be most effective. But two things to bear in mind with all of this. First is that research might not be able to answer the types of questions that we want answers to. We can only answer certain types of questions with research and we shouldn't go beyond that in the implications that we draw. And secondly, that strong claims require strong evidence. So if you see really strong implications being drawn from a piece of research, you would want to see really rigorous evidence underpinning that. So what do we need if we're going to be able to use research in this valuable and positive way? Well, I think there's three things that we need to do. So first of all, I think we need high quality research reviews. We need to know what we already know. Um, but importantly, these have to be of a good enough quality. So what does that mean? That means things like using clear selection criteria and having a clear purpose for the review. So no cherry picking of results. I think um, the studies that go into a research review need to have rigorous quality checks so we know that they're reliable. And we need to have the right kind of balanced and nuanced interpretations of the research and the implications of them that don't go beyond what the research studies themselves can um, contribute. I think ideally these reviews would be produced by teams of researchers and practitioners who can weigh up the strength of the evidence and can think about the um, sensible implications of this. And I think we also need to consider the measures that are used. So if we want to have this broad and rich view of mathematics, then we need the research studies that we're basing our um, conclusions on to be measuring that kind of raw, rich and broad view of mathematics and not just measuring factual knowledge or procedural skills. So the second thing that we need is some, I think we need translational research. So what do I mean by this? Well, if we think of a very simple view of the kind of research to practice pipeline, it might be the idea that we run a basic research study and then we think about communicating those results to teachers. And this communication might take the form of 
the researchers just saying, here, this is what we found, you figure out a way to apply it in the classroom. Um, or alternatively, um, it might be suggestions to use interventions that have been developed for research, just carry them over directly to the classroom. And I think both of those are inappropriate. So what do we need? Well, I think we need to change our view of what it is that is being translated into practice. It isn't the findings of individual research studies. Instead, it should be theory that is built up and supported by several pieces of evidence across different research studies. And when I talk about theory, I don't mean big, complex psychological theories, but rather a set of reliable findings that have a clear explanation for why those effects um, arise. And this is what we should think about translating to the classroom. But still, we can't go straight from that to communication of research because there is still something missing. And this is where I think we need translational research. So this isn't the same as translation of research. It's a different type of research that takes these evidence-based theories and thinks, what might that look like in the classroom? How might we be able to use that in the classroom? This requires a different different type of research to the large scale evaluation trials, and it involves um, teachers and researchers working together. So if it's so important, you might be wondering why aren't we doing that already? And that's for a very practical reason, that actually at the moment it's very difficult to get funding for this kind of research. And I think that's something that we really need. And then the third thing that I think we need is we need to not just be thinking about communication of research, but we need to be thinking about collaboration between researchers and practitioners. So we need to allow researchers and practitioners to spend time together to negotiate and discuss research and the implications of that. So we've been trying a couple of things here in Loughborough that, are, that involve setting up those kinds of structures. So this year we've been running um, a researchers in residence scheme. So this is a pilot scheme that we've been running with um, NCETM and the maths hubs, where a researcher from Loughborough is linked up with a particular maths hub and then they can spend time talking about research, thinking about the implications of research and building up this negotiated and shared understanding of what research means for practice. The other thing that we've um, had the opportunity is that fortunately we've been given some research some funding to set up a new research centre. So this is the um, Centre for Early Mathematics Learning, which is launching um, next month. And because we've got this um, uh, long scale funding over five years, it means we are able to do the kind of translational research that I think is so often missing. So we'll be having researchers and practitioners um, working together to identify questions, to design activities, and to evaluate how they operate in practice. And if you're interested in hearing more about the work that that centre produces, that you can sign up better um, on our website. So to conclude, I think there really are exciting opportunities for research informed practice, but only if we have a balanced and appropriate view of what research can provide. And misusing research risks losing the value of what it can contribute entirely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Camilla. That was a great and very interesting overview. So thank you for that. And the specifics were fascinating as well. Um, we now move on to our second speakers. This time it's a team. Um, Ruth Trundley, John Mortimer and Jess Home. Ruth Trundley is a primary maths advisor and maths hub lead. She has led numerous action research projects collaborating with adults and children in schools and two of her colleagues from Pilton Infant School, John and Jess, are joining her to tell us about their collaboration. Over to you. Thanks very much, Jenny. So thank you, for, thank you for inviting us. And I'm just going to very briefly um, give an overview of some of the work that I've been involved in with um, Jess and John at, at Pilton, a little context of their school, which is an infant school in North Devon, and their involvement in, I think, that translational research that Camilla has just spoken about. So we went back over six years, and uh, in sort of 2016, the school was involved in a research project looking at the use of assigning competence and pre-teaching. 
and that brought them into um, contact with collaborative lesson research for the first time, which is Japanese lesson study. And that's become a bit of a theme through the different things that have happened in the school. Um, they were involved in an understanding structured number lines project over a couple of years, which also involved some collaborative lesson research. And then a research and innovation work group with the Jurassic Maths Hub focused on collaborative lesson research. And around about the same time, uh, the school chose to join a teaching for mastery teacher research group. And in the past year, Jess has been involved in a very small scale rec and rec action research project. So with all of that in mind, um, John, if you'd like to sort of start us and often say, why do you get involved in these research projects? <laughs> um, well, yeah, several reasons, really. Firstly, from a personal perspective, I think it's interesting for us as staff members, you know, to develop our practice, but also it's really relevant to our school. So, that, you know, we, we pick the projects that we think are going to have the biggest impact in our school. Um, we're always wanting to develop our own practice and wanting to learn the improve the learning experience for the children. Um, so again, we, we look at the projects that we think are really going to have an impact on that. Um, and a lot of the projects fit alongside kind of a teaching for mastery approach, which we've been working on embedding within our school for probably the last five or six years. Um, and we also really like the, these projects because you're actively participating in a project and shaping the outcome um, rather than just being kind of an observer or passenger, maybe when you sometimes attend like maths courses that we go to. Um, and I think the final reason really is, is partly to do with you, Ruth, and your maths team. And kind of as a school, we've got a good relationship with you and your maths team. Um, you know, we, we do a lot of work with you. You know our school, we know you, and kind of we know the approaches that each have. Um, and we really value the work that you do in kind of looking at outside influences. So looking at, you know, other countries that teach maths in maybe different and possibly more effective ways, like China and Japan and the way that you can invest the time into looking into those approaches and doing that research and then kind of feeding back the useful bits to us really and and, and then we get a chance to, to try things out and see how it works so I think that those are the kind of the key reasons why we get involved. Thank you and I think that sort of that relationship that Camilla was talking about that you need between somebody leading the research and the, and the practitioners is, is really important and the learning then happens both ways because I always learn huge amounts working with you. Um, so the second question we want to consider was um, what sort of things have you learned from your experiences being involved in these different research projects that's had an impact both on your teaching and on the learning in your classrooms. Jess do you want to pick that up? Yeah I think from our point of view as soon as what Camilla just said every project we've been on has been vital and it's then been integrated into our school at way the way that we, we would teach um, so I'll talk about three of them so the first one was the Rec and Rec project and, and for us as teachers I wouldn't necessarily have the time to research and look into how much this Rec and Rec can be used within our school um, so it's really useful as part of that you know project for me to evaluate with you and look at the Rec and Rec and its usefulness um, you know, we found out it was really useful for us to use in year one for the number bonds from, you know, zero to 10 and going on to zero to 20. And for us to really support fluency, because that was a big focus for us in our school. Um, and also a big, you know, idea from us is knowing that bigger numbers are made of smaller numbers and you can use the re rec and rec quite well with that. Um, the other project we were on was the number line project and we, we created a whole report with that and you can never look on the Babcock Maths website if you want to see the report we made. And for us, we were really looking at that kind of cardinal value. And I, I don't think we quite recognise we weren't really looking at that ordinal value. I think you can be quite swayed to just think, right, Numicon's the big thing we're using at the minute, or, you know, cubes are what we're using at the minute, or the uh, base, te you know, 10 frame. So for us, we really need to focus on ordinal value. It's become integral as part of our planning. Um, we've always made sure that now the children are able to draw number lines as, a, you know, that effectiveness, being able to know there are equal space but also recognizing how close numbers were. You know, we used to have children that had 69 take away 68 and they'd sit there and take away all 68, not recognizing how close they are to each other. And it's actually difference we're looking at. Um, so that was, that was really important for us. And it has become something we use every year now. Um, and then finally, it was the Mastery Maths projects working with the NCTM work groups. Um, for us, we initially was looking at STEM sentence work and that has become integral as part of our everyday life now, and not just in maths, um, it was helping those children who were really struggling and being able to scaffold a sentence for them who they can actually help reason now, you know, within their mass learning. And, and that was really important for us as a school to, to embed everywhere. 
uh, and also just we, we have those opportunities in those mass groups to specifically look at the non statutory guidance which as a teacher I, I don't know if I have the time really to look at that on my own and actually look at it in great detail you know we work specifically looking at you know multiplication in just one specific strand of a year two and as a teacher I'm I'm grateful that we had that opportunity to look at the small steps and, and now that's become part of my everyday practice. I'm making sure that when I'm planning, I'm looking for those small steps for the you know, planning process and we're focusing on those misconceptions, you know, what the image could show as a misconception even. Um, so that's become part of our, our current practice and at our pace as well, you know, when we worked alongside you in those work projects, we were able to work on them in our own time but actually then embed it. it it wasn't in addition to our what we were doing already in this school mm -hmm. great thank you very much and um, so the final question i think john you're going to to come back on this one is is so how has your involvement with various different projects had an impact on professional development in your school um yeah i think it's had a massive impact on our professional development um you know, we, we've developed really our own sort of smaller version of collaborative lesson research, which we use in school. Um, so, you know, we put teachers into teams um, and we probably do two, at least two cycles of this a year. Um, we put teachers into teams of three teachers and they work together as a team of three teachers in a staff meeting to plan, say, a maths lesson. And then one of the te for one of the teachers and then they will teach it with the other two teachers watching. Um, and then that, that process repeats so that all three teachers have taught a lesson and they've all had a lesson planned, you know, collaboratively. So we're putting staff meeting time into it because we value the importance of the team planning. You know, the, the collaborative lesson projects that we've been involved in have really shown us that you learn so much when you sit and plan a lesson with other people um, and you really break down the small steps and you think about, you know, what should, what's the first thing we should do? And actually sometimes that turns out to be maybe the third or the fourth thing you should do you've got to unpick it and go back even further so that we really value that time of, you know and staff meeting time which is really precious time in the school but giving that time over to get people planning together um and after each lesson there's a review session and you know e each cycle that we do there's always a theme running through it so it might be that we're focusing on fluency or we're focusing on um use of stem sentences um you know something like that um but not just maths we've we've adapted this and used this in other subjects as well so we're using a little collaborative lesson cycle we've used it through english science and pe you know we can use it for every subject it's great professional development um and for subject leaders in schools it's a really good way of um embedding concepts you know as a subject leader you might go out on training courses but not everybody else does so it's a really good way of you embedding and passing the messages on you know, you can come back from a course and talk to teachers about something, but actually, if you all sit there and plan it and work it through three lessons, they really start to understand it and they can really see where you're coming from and take it on board. So that's been really good. Um, and it's helped us embed, you know, some things across us all, you know, consistent use of images all across the school, um, consistent use of resources, consistent use of language, consistent language around symbols, things like that. Um, and you know it's, it's often influenced by the outside projects that we take part in with yourself and other people and you know we bring the, the key messages back from that and embed it through the school um and actually the, the staff really really embrace it and they really love it you know feedback from staff you know we've had comments like it's the best cpd that they've done because it's actually is relevant to the school and it's relevant to you and it's relevant to your class um it's kind of a non-threatening way of being observed you know you've got two people in your lesson watching you but actually you've all planned the lesson together so you know that if something goes wrong then you all planned it so you've all got a part in that and actually because you've all planned it you can unpick what it was that went wrong and learn from that um they really value the shared planning time um and also when we get new staff it's a really good way of getting new staff up to speed with how we work as a school you know how we teach maths what maths looks like in our classrooms again they can go and observe with the teachers which is valuable but actually to spend some time planning with other people and seeing what it's like you know in the year group before yours and the year group after yours see where the children are coming from and where they're going to next that's really important as well so yeah then i think it's had a massive impact on what we do Thank you both very much. Thank you for coming in and talking about that today. And we've just come to the end of our time. Um, so, so thank you both. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you. Thank you very much, all of you. That was 
really powerful to hear a, a, a real case study of what's going on in your classrooms and your school. Um, our third speaker today is Paul Rowlandson. He's a lead teacher at Trinity Academy Halifax and studying for his doctorate at Durham University. So he's a teacher researcher, if you like. He's involved in professional development with colleagues, both in his school and in the wider context, and posts his ideas on his blog as well. He's going to tell us about an approach that he finds effective in secondary classrooms. Over to you, Paul. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'd like to use this presentation today to talk about uh, the importance of nuance in discussions about mass education research, particularly when it's applied into the classroom. As discourse about the applications of research and teaching can sometimes become a little bit dichotomized when it's, when it's talked about for applications in the classroom. And to do this, I would like to use a strategy that's had increased attention over the last few years and is also the subject of my own PhD, and that is interleaving. So, what is interleaving? Most definitions describe interleaving as being an alternative to another strategy called blocking. Here's a typical example of a definition of interleaving. In many reviews of these two strategies, it is often argued that interleaving is superior to another strategy called blocking. Now, while there are many studies that do support this claim, there are also some studies that do find blocking to be superior to interleaving, and some studies that have found them to be equal or no significant difference it's probably more likely that these two strategies simply have their own purposes and uh, probably provide those purposes in circumstances that suit those particular needs more than anything else. Descriptions of blocking and interleaving can sometimes appear a little bit binary, as if there is a clear black and white distinction between the two strategies. However, in practical situations, it's more likely that these are really adjectives that describe a spectrum of strat strategies with many shades of gray in between. So for example, the two sequences of questions you can see on the screen now give an idea of an extreme blocking or extreme interleaving. On the left, all the questions require the exact same formula and are solved using the exact same steps. On the right, all the questions from completely different topics. However, there are lots of different sequences of questions that can sort of fall in between these two in some way or other. Also, when discussions get dichotomized to a big degree, it feels sometimes like they're the only two strategies that are available. Like there's nothing else a teacher can do other than block or interleave, or every strategy can be described as block or interleaving. When I think in practice, there's usually a lot of strategies that teachers can use that can have the same benefits as either of these. Teaching is full of strategies all the time. So let's take a look at how interleaving has been researched, unpick this a little bit more, by using a very significant study from Rora and Friends in 2019. Nearly 800 high school students were split into two groups. There was a blocking group and an interleaving group. And each group completed eight assignments over the space of roughly 102 days. And then they were given a test on four particular topics afterwards. For the blocking group, assignments two, four, six, and eight were all based on single topics. So for example, assignment six for the blocking group looked like this. All the questions were on equations of straight lines and there were no equation straight line questions in any other assignment. All of the symbols you can see in white there are filler questions that did not relate to the test. While as the interleaving group, they had eight assignments were all completely mixed, one question from each of the four tested topics and then four filler questions. For example, assignment six looked like this for the interleaving group. And the results afterwards in the test found that the interleaving group significantly outperformed the blocking group. So does that mean that mixed assignments are better than single topic assignments? Let's look at the nuance a tiny bit. One of the things we can see from the examples at the bottom are that on the left, we have extreme case of blocking and on the right, we have extreme case of interleaving. So while in this case, interleaving did lead to better results than blocking, it didn't really necessarily tell us a lot about cases that fall in between these two, things that aren't quite so extreme on either side. Let's look at some of the benefits of interleaving or some of the claim benefits. Here's one claim benefit. Now, from a theoretical point of view, this makes complete sense. However, from a practical point of view, mathematics isn't simply a case of matching procedures with question types. Maths is more messy than that. 
So for example, a single strategy can often be used to solve multiple types of questions. And a single question can often be solved using multiple strategies. And sometimes the thing that affects what strategy can and cannot be used is so subtle, it can't be learned through just simple association. Another claim benefit of interleaving is that it helps learners to distinguish between things that are difficult to discriminate between. Now, I don't think this is the case in Rora's research necessarily because the questions are so different. No one ever confuses finding the area of a circle of how to write the equation of a straight line. But in cases where topics are quite similar or the question types can be very similar, there's definitely a case for learning to uh, tell those apart and decide which formula to use when. And that could be done with, with an assignment that mixes all these things together. But that's not the only way it can be done. These questions could be given as a set of cards that students rearrange into different piles. That way they, they can compare questions that require different formulas and get the benefits of interleaving. And then they can compare questions that use the same formula and get the benefits of blocking to see what they have in common. Alternatively, a completely different strategy could be to ask students to design their own question that meets a certain type of criteria. That will make them think about what makes a question require sin rather than cos or tan in a very similar way and is nothing to do with interleaving or blocking whatsoever. Another claim benefit is that interleaving reduces attention attenuation. In other words, it stops students from going into autopilot when they're answering a series of questions. So for example, when students are answering a series of questions like this, this block set of questions, it, they don't really need to exert sustained mental effort throughout the entire exercise because all the questions are exactly the same as each other, just do the same thing as the last question, but with different numbers. Whereas with a, a mixed excitement like this, students can't really go into autopilot because every question asks them to do something completely different. They have to sustain more attention all the way through, arguably. However, if that's, our, if that's our intention, if that's our goal, mixed assignments aren't the only way to do that. We could give students questions that are all based on a single topic, but get progressively more difficult as they go. However, from the research I've seen so far with women to leave in, it tends to only get compared to very, very repetitive blocked assignments. And I, don't, I haven't really come across any interleaving research that compares it to graduated assignments like this one. And if anyone does come across any, please help send it to me and I'll, I'll love it from the PhD. Thank you. The, um, the final benefit of interleaving I like to talk about is that it sometimes it can be um, help introduce spacing into the curriculum. So for example, in Rora's case, the students who were in the interleave group, they saw one circle question every two weeks for about 102 days. So it became spaced out. But there are other ways of, of, of introducing space and into the curriculum other than uh, just remix assignments. And a lot of it probably happens anyway. So for example, when students learn to find the area of a circle, they don't just do it in one lesson and never see the formula again. They, they tend to spend a few lessons on it at the start and they'll keep seeing that formula again and again throughout their entire curriculum. And quite often when students learn a skill in one area, they often apply, apply it to other topics. For example, when they learn to multiply fractions, they then find themselves multiplying fractions when they are doing probability trees, for example. Or we can create questions that put quite different topics together, like what Tom Franken was uh, shared, I think it was in the first meeting. So to summarize this session, this wasn't necessarily to, um, to put a down on interleaving research. A lot of the research is really, really, really good. And it's not necessary to, to suggest that uh, interleaving is not a good strategy. It can be a good strategy. The main things I'd like to take away from this particular um, presentation is that there's more to it than that. There's much more to teaching, there's much more to mathematics than simply blocking or interleaving or whatever combination of strategies are being compared, whether it's spacing versus massing or direct instruction versus uh, investigative work. There is much more to that. So we should avoid getting drawn into these false dichotomies about teaching. Yes, okay, a lot of the time the research follows the same methods as medical research, where they take two distinct strategies and compare them with each other to see what happens. But when we go to a chemist, it's not like they only ever have two drugs available for you to buy, either the tested drug or the placebo. And it doesn't really, uh, it's not like every doctor will give you the same drug to every single treatment, whether it's a rash or diarrhea. Normally, when you go to a chemist, you, you, you buy the thing that, that helps your own diagnosis, and there's usually multiple things available. So rather than talking about which strategies are better than other strategies, I think going forward, when we talk about what next of research, I think the key discussion should be about what are the purposes behind strategies? What does each strategy achieve? 
how precisely do these strategies achieve those things and whether other strategies can do similar stuff or maybe not just talk about strategies at all and just focus on what it is we're trying to get students to do. But more than anything, more than anything, is to remember that mathematics is not simple. It is nuanced. And so is the teaching and learning of mathematics as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. That was very interesting and, and linked up nicely with the other two presenters. So the, de the detail on that was helpful, I think. So last but not least, uh, we're pleased to welcome Lucy Rycroft-Smith. She's a writer, researcher, speaker and designer in maths education and works at Cambridge Mathematics as a framework designer and writes the Espressos, which are maths education briefings research briefings for teachers. Lucy is going to share her ideas about the place of research in classrooms. Over to you, Lucy. Thank you so much, Jenny. And thank you to the other speakers. I've been listening and frantically making notes, thinking, oh yes, oh yes. So many uh, similarities um, and so many things that I can pick up on. So um, someone maybe give me a little thumbs up if you can see that, Jenny. So I'm going to just uh, sum up a little bit on what we've heard um, and just talk to you a little bit about what now. Um, in terms of uh, maths education research, maths education practice, and thinking about how that relates to um, us in maths education um, together, really. And so lots of lots of thoughts there. So I'm um, uh, at the University of Cambridge. You can follow me at Honeypot Squared on Twitter. And uh, I've done some drawings today, um, just for a little bit of um, variety in the slides. Um, so what I'm going to start with um, is this idea, which um, is quite familiar to me. And I wonder if you've heard it, which is that teachers make the weather in their classrooms. Um, and I've tried to represent this visually. Um, and by that, I guess I understand the idea that whatever's going on outside in terms of their personal lives, their schools, um, politically, globally, economically, teachers are really, really good at making sure that their students feel safe, comfortable, heard, listened to, um, that they belong and that they create a climate in the classroom where things are different and OK. And that is a really important, crucial part of teaching, as we all know. And the issue really being that that's work for teachers. And it's a kind of work that sits alongside all of the other work that teachers have to do, but is rarely acknowledged. Um, and I'm acknowledging it now. It's valuable, important, crucial work. And certainly in my career as a teacher, um, this is a really good visualization of what I look like a lot of the time. Um, I felt lonely, I felt isolated, I felt emotionally depleted, I felt sad. Um, not pictured children of my own saying, mommy, I need your attention now. Um, and I think that for me brings me to the really crucial question that I ask myself often and I think all of us who work in education around teachers and practitioners need to keep asking ourselves and that is this what can we do to nourish and support teachers emotionally and intellectually and increasingly I'm starting to see overlap between those two And so you might be thinking, what's research got to do with any of this? So I'm hoping I'll answer that question shortly. We can use research in education, and I think we do. And I think lots of speakers touched on this, particularly Camilla, as a way to add more shoulds to a teacher's life. And I see this all the time. I see, um, research and researchers and people around research and people who are translating research saying to teachers research says you should do this no you should do this no you must do this no the research says and that teacher is then 
just in the same situation they were before, but there's more pulls on their time, more tensions, more conflict. There's a, a different way to use research, I think, and that's to give teachers the time and the space and the support and the professional respect to engage with research themselves. And you'll see the conceptualization here is the difference between research as a tool used against or a weapon used against teachers and actually research is something that teachers come to and are offered in their own time and space. And really importantly, when I say engaging with, I think I'm using it differently to some people. Um, so I don't mean reading it and doing what it says. Um, I mean a couple of things. I mean being free to disagree, certainly being critical, considering contexts and asking questions. And I really mean thinking about relationships and partnerships with researchers um, and people around education generally, they don't have to be necessarily researchers, and then specifically teachers doing and publishing research themselves. And I think that's the part that is interesting because often teachers um, feel that they can't or don't know what research is or could constitute and that part gets left out. Um, but what's really interesting is listening to some of these talks, hearing about the quality of those relationships really comes out, really shines through. Something that I came across um, a while back in education is this book, um, and I wonder if you've heard of it, uh, called The Rights of the Reader. It's, it's, it's about reading, it's a children's book um, by a French writer called Daniel Panat. And in this, he sets out, and you'll, you'll see the very recognizable illustration by Quentin Blake there, he sets out this kind of manifesto that you can't make someone read. And he sets out what he calls the rights of the reader, um, that when people are being brought to and offered things to read, they have the right not to read. They have the right to skip things. They have the right to dip in. They have the right to read anything. And I thought about this and I thought, well, I, I kind of see an analogy here with research. And for me, I think, the research reader has rights too. And it was really interesting hearing Camilla say some really similar things. So we'll see, we'll see if you agree, because hey, I'm a researcher and I expect you to disagree and be critical with me too. So here's what I think are the rights of the research reader. I think potentially the research reader has the right not to read research. <laughs> First one, there you go, or to use it. Um, I think they have the right to skip, to skip to the abstract. So for me, that's pretty much what I do most of the time. I call it research sniffing. Hmm. <laughs> do I like it? Is it off? Um, to skip to the conclusions, to skip to the implications if they exist. The right not to finish a research paper. Very important. The right to, to read a research paper again, to revisit. The right to read any research by anyone published anywhere. And that's particularly problematic because that right is uh, not well established or protected. The right to connect or not connect research ideas to their own practice. And this is the second page. The right to read research ideas anywhere, especially on social media and blogs. And this is really connected to ideas of hierarchy and access and who is allowed access to research ideas specifically. I have a lot of discussions on social media uh, with all sorts of people. I think it's very valuable and important and potentially quite democratizing at times and not at others. The right to dip in. I've just taken that one directly from Panek. The right to read research out loud or with others. The right to be quiet, to stop and think, or not to respond at all. The right to criticise research ideas, and in a number of ways and in a number of formats, including publicly, which is extremely important. And finally, the right to have keywords clearly defined in the research. So these are some of my ideas in terms of the rights of the research reader. I'd be very interested to hear yours. 
So what now? I talked about the idea that we should be asking how we could nourish teachers emotionally and intellectually. And I potentially said that I think research could offer one way to do that. Well, here's one particular example where this did that for me as a young teacher. Um, and you don't have to agree and you don't have to believe me, but this was something that I read um, when I was starting out in teaching. And I found it to be beautiful, galvanizing, empowering. It changed my practice. Um, it changed my mind. And I thought it was particularly interesting. And I've revisited it many times since. Um, so I'll read it to you. To do mathematics is to engage in an act of discovery and conjecture, intuition and inspiration, to be in a state of confusion, not because it makes no sense to you, but because you gave it sense and you still don't understand what your creation is up to, to have a breakthrough idea, to be frustrated as an artist, to be awed and overwhelmed by an almost painful beauty, to be alive, damn it. Remove this from mathematics and you can have all the conferences you like, it won't matter. Operate all you want, doctors. Your patient is already dead. And this style of writing is very characteristic of this piece. So do go and look it up. So finally, I've offered the idea that teachers could and should access research directly. Here are some places that they could go. Um, I write research, um, as Jenny said, research summaries for teachers called espressos, which are available on the Cambridge Maths website as downloadable PDFs. And also have just written a book um, which explores this idea that you can take research and engage with it critically as a teacher. And uh, you can actually write in the book, uh, which again talks about the sort of idea, talks to the idea of a dialogue, a critical dialogue. Um, I think a lot of people don't know about Google Scholar. It's just like Google, but for research papers, lots of researchers use it. Um, one of those pictures is a website called ResearchGate, which again, you just search for research there. It's pretty straightforward. You can look at researchers' profiles. There's kind of a social media aspect to it. British Society for Research into Learning Mathematics, I find to be a wonderful organisation which brings together researchers and teachers and relationships, um, has conferences, allows people to give talks and discussions your local library, don't forget researchers in books too. And finally, as I said, social media, um, a wonderful place for sharing and discussing research. And I'm gonna end there. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Lucy. We're now going to move to just a few questions. And first up, I have a question for Camilla. What is the best way for teachers to get involved in this sort of translational research? It sounded very exciting. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think as I as I pointed out that at the moment there isn't a huge amount of um, uh, funding for this kind of research, so there aren't lots of opportunities. I mean, I think the maths hubs do provide this, particularly through their work groups. There are opportunities um, to do some of that work, and so I think I would suggest um, people look there at the maths hubs and what they're doing. Um, and I hope there will be more opportunities to do this kind of thing because at the moment there really there aren't a lot. And because of the funding question, because for teachers to be involved in that, they need to be bought out of the classroom. We can't expect teachers to do that on top of their teaching load. And so there is a cost to getting those um, relationships working really well. But I hope there will be lots of more opportunities um, in the future for this kind of thing. All right. Thank you very much, Camilla. Ruth, Jess and John, you talked about so many benefits to those projects and happily you did manage to get that funding what do you think are the biggest benefits to these sorts of joint research projects if you're trying to convince someone to get involved um i think it's very it's everybody learns that's one of the benefits that everybody learns everybody is engaging in you have some research question but we're exploring together with the learners and the practitioners and people leading the research and it's just it's just a richness of opportunity to explore your own thinking in that context with other people and try things with learners and really observe really observe closely what happens um, which often you don't get the sense of when you're just looking at a piece of existing research um, Jess and John I don't know what you what you think 
I think it's um, it gives you the time to kind of step back and reflect and think about you know what it is that you do on a day-to-day -day basis and and you know if you're just doing that all the time then you just get lost in it so being involved in these projects kind of opens your eye your eyes or opens your mind a little bit to, to the new things that are out there and you know it doesn't all work some of it you try and think no oh, we're, we're going to stick with what we we're doing before um but often you you know you pull out little bits and just the power of getting together and planning with other people and working with other people you know you just like Ruth says everybody learns you know we all learn a huge amount on these projects and I think the biggest thing is getting your senior leadership team on board I mean I'm very lucky John's really interested in everything we have to do with maths and if it's, it's allowing me to time out and you know and also the NCTM is paid for and to some extent there are bursaries available for lots of research projects so it's convincing your SLT team that it's worthwhile it's not an addition to it. it's something you're going to do as part of your action plan for the year anyway. Mm. Right thank you very much. Um, Paul there were a couple of very specific um, questions and comments about interleaving um, how do you balance this idea of nuance in research with the practicalities of would interleaving help students prepare better for assessments and exams? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think in terms of exams, the exams themselves are interleaved. So absolutely, as a, as a high school teacher who's 11, so they got their exam on Friday, um, they've been getting a lot of interleave practice because it suits that purpose of them selecting the right strategy or help them on the Friday. But there's a, um, sometimes the conversations about uh, some of the strategies we use don't necessarily pin down and precise of whether we're using them while students are learning new things or whether while they are revising old things. Um, and there is research in, in both of those in terms of interleaving. There is some research about learning to match paintings to artists uh, and other things like that. And there's some research about practicing for revision. Um, but they are they are quite different pieces of research uh, and, and they're nuanced in their own ways. So I'd, I'd more so encourage people to think about what it is they're trying to do um, more than anything else and pick something that suits towards towards that really. But it is it can be a bit of a rabbit hole in terms of nuance because you, you get the headlines through Twitter or through conferences and, or, and, and nuance doesn't really travel as fast as a headline more than anything else. So I think if anything, I would if I hear a headline, I would measure against my own experience as a teacher because you have however many hours of experience as a teacher compared to a sentence or two um, what we read on Twitter. I think I'll, I'll compare the two of them each other and see how much it makes sense uh, to you as a teacher. Right. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, Lucy, you, you gave us lots of ideas there of ways that we could engage in research. Um, I really liked your rights of the research reader. But how do you balance that against um, Jane, who said, in the current climate of teaching, how can you ever have the time or energy to engage with that? So how can busy teachers engage with a full range of research ideas? Right. And I think that's a very good point. And thank you for making it, Jane. It's it's a very honest point. <laughs> I, I think there were many, many years in my teaching career where I didn't engage with research at all. And I think there are many people who feel that way, too. And I think part of the problem is is characterizing what research is. I think often we think, oh, it's it's a thing to add to my to do list. Read that paper, you know, read read that book. And it's this great big monolith of a very important um, perhaps self-important thing and sometimes it can be as I tried to make the point as small as a tweet it can be a conversation it can be something that is um, perhaps smaller and less scary than we think it can be a dialogue that you see over here and take part in there are so many um, aspects to engaging with research that are not just reading a research paper that i think people perhaps don't think of when they first think of research and i think these things are changing um, and good that they're changing and what we've talked about today a lot is building relationships with people who are in and around research you just become part of that and so watching people engage on social media and starting to become part of that conversation then perhaps is the first step for some people or starting to overhear conversations where you think oh that's interesting I have an opinion on that right that's engaging with research too it isn't just I've got this big stack of papers oh I, I need to get to that after my marking and don't sell yourself short, Lucy. Lots of people putting in the chat, sign up for the espressos, that they're a great way in. Right, thank you very much to 
um, all of our panelists there. And we're now going to turn to our wider panelists um, and ask them to share their key messages about mathematics and how research can support teachers in conveying this view. We will just pass through everyone in turn, starting with Ruth, please. Thanks, Ashley. Um, so my belief is that mathematics has thinking at its heart and therefore teaching mathematics is about developing mathematical thinkers. And this starts from noticing, making connections with what you already understand, wondering and involves grappling with ideas and representing them in different ways in order to make sense of them. And what you might do next, try something in your context that interests you arising from what you've heard or what you've read closely observe how your learners respond to the mathematical thinking provoked by whatever it is you've tried. If you can, capture your observations some way um, and reflect on them. And if possible, um, share them as part of a community that could be in your school, your locality, your maths hub and maths association through an HEI, through social media. Have a go, share what you've done with somebody and then decide what that means for you with your learners. Mike, over to you. Thank you, Ruth. Um, so Ruth talked about engaging the head in mathematics. I want to talk about engaging the heart. I think maths is full of contradictions. It's exciting, but it can also be boring. It can be challenging. It can be easy. It can be playful. It can be useful. It can be delightful and it can be frustrating. In other words, it embodies all of human emotions. And I think we really have to recognize that and acknowledge that the negative as well as the positive. I think the fantasy that all mathematics lessons can be all singing and dancing is something we have to put aside. And in terms of going forward, thinking about your own experiences, when did you find mathematics engaging? When did you find it frustrating? What made the difference? Sharing, as Ruth has said, some of that thinking with your learners and being open in conversations in classrooms and talking about when you know that moment, we all recognize that moment in the classroom when the energy gets sucked out, you know the kids are stuck actually acknowledging that, talking about it, recognizing that learning mathematics is about engaging with the full gamut of human emotions. Um, over to Alison. Great, thank you, Mike. Uh, so for me, maths is more than you think it is. It's so much more than numbers on a page or calculations we're asked to solve. It's about thinking, reasoning, making decisions. It's about not getting to the answer, whether it's right or wrong, but about how we approach the question. And just when you think you understand it, you come across a problem that ambushes you and you rediscover the amazing world of maths all over again. So where next? Um, again, kind of, you know, echoing what Ruth and Mike have just said, you know, why not be a researcher in your own classroom or within your own mathematics circle? I think what these webinars have shown is how research can be a catalyst for making us pause, think, reflect, not just carry on with what we did last week, last month, last year, find out what children think, why they approach maths in particular ways, how they feel about the maths they do. So let's all start thinking about mathematical thinking just a little bit more. Livia, over to you. Thank you. So for me, maths is more than just getting the right answer. It's also about finding interesting questions of your own to ask and answer and think about what happens if I change this and where you could take it from here. Talk to the students, ask the, ask the students, what questions could you ask about this when they're working on a maths problem? Over to Tom. Okay, thank you. Uh, for me, maths is for more people. So I think everyone is capable of thinking mathematically and entitled to interesting and varied opportunities to do so. So I think every people needs a task to learn, something to think about while they're doing it and something that's worth talking about afterwards. Anne? Thank you, Tom. Maths for me is always more about building and enriching concepts than remembering fragments and facts and procedures. So for any mathematical task, the first step can always be to think, what's going on here? What does it mean? An interpretation, the relationships involved, a representation, an example, before deciding what might be helpful, which might be a form of reasoning or a process or a classification that you can adapt and transform and use and expand. This is what doing maths is. And I think you can nest all your teaching within that idea 
even if you're teaching one little fragment of a procedure that you have been told people must practice or something, you can still nest it within all that. Nest your teaching within that and seek support of similar thinkers. Oh, I'm passing on to Flavia. Thank you. Well, MAPS is more than classroom and homework. MAPS saves lives and time. MAPS brings progress and justice. Numbers, patterns, and probabilities are everywhere. Understanding MAPS empowers individuals' decision-making, career choice, and perseverance. Challenges in teaching and learning maths are multi-layered and require intricate solutions. Research has shown that boys and girls have equivalent capacity and brain resources to learn and perform mathematics. Myths about maths and gender stereotypes prevail in, in our societies, lessening uh, proper prospects for girls. So researchers can use their voices to empower girls' education hand over to Camila. Thank you. So I think maths is about seeing the world in a mathematical way and about combining skills and knowledge with understanding to make sense of it. And I think everybody has the capacity to do this given the right opportunities. And research can contribute to this, but only with greater collaboration among researchers and practitioners and also policymakers, and with a shared view of the richness of maths. Paul. Cool. Mathematics is more than simply learn to associate each problem type with its appropriate method. And going forward, we should always bear in mind when we engage with research that teaching, learning and research are far more nuanced than just the research headlines and binary comparisons between two opposing strategies. So when we hear a great headline from research, rather than thinking, oh, I want to do that, think, oh, that's interesting. I wonder why that happened. Over to Lucy, please. <laughs> Thank you. So I think, as we've heard, maths is more than just applying formulae or learning procedures, um, but also mathematicians are more, and they're more than just lone white male geniuses that come along once in a generation. Um, and I think every single pupil deserves to know this and to feel this. And I think research can be more too. I think it can be more than just a dusty tome or an obscure volume, but research can be a living, breathing source of power and empowerment for teachers and emancipation for them. And as Anne says, a source of resistance, a way for teachers to connect with powerful ideas that support often what they know or feel already to be true. They just have to be connected with it. Thank you. Back to Jenny in the studio. Thank you very much, all of you. That was wonderful. Couldn't have asked for better from all of you. So thank you. Maths is more started with concern about the limited view of mathematics as a subject that's just about following rules and learning facts. I think we've shown you that it is more than that over the course of these last few sessions. We were also worried about the way in which work we've done as researchers, some of us, and which has been valued by teachers and learners was being portrayed. We know many people working with children and in schools and other settings who share our views that maths is a rich and creative discipline, and we wanted to build on that. Here is a slide showing all those who've supported our endeavours. Um, um, huge thanks to though, them. White Rose deserve a special mention for giving us free access to their mailing lists, platform and booking facilities. We really couldn't have done it without them. And Thanks to, to the subjects associations and all the other people who've got behind us. We will be sharing a PDF of this with you all in the next week or so, and that will have links to further details about all these organizations and the way in which they've been inv involved and what they do so you can take things further yourself. We would like to thank all our speakers and everyone right the way through who's been involved Every single person who's been involved in this initiative has given of their time and expertise with no payment whatsoever. And we're all indebted to all of them for that kindness. So what next? Follow the blog and tweets and express your views, join local groups, find someone near you to collaborate with who shares, shares your enthusiasms and start doing something to make a difference 
in ways that matter to you. The smallest changes can make a big difference to the learners you're working with, the teachers you're working with. We'll end with our creation on Menti, which you've been putting together, and we'll be writing a piece about Masses More through which we'll publicise what we've been doing and it will be available through all the channels of all the organisations we've been working with. We hope you'll look out for that. Please continue to join in the chat on the, our Twitter feed. And thank you, all of you, for taking the time to listen to us and participating in these sessions. Your response has been magnificent and we really appreciate your attention and your time. Thank you.